Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Cameron Guerra, an engineer here at IT Pro TV. And with me today is Taylor Fostek, one of the engineers on my team and my boss. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Taylor. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, Cam. And I'm really excited today because we have a special guest with us, Sandy McGuire. Thanks for joining us, Sandy. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is awesome. So, Sandy, for people who may not know who you are already, how would you describe yourself? Uh, I write a lot of Haskell. Good That's, start. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. You caught me off guard here, Taylor. <laughs> Well, uh, then let me say some things that I know sure. about you. So okay. uh, you're better prepared than I am here. In addition to writing a lot of Haskell, you write a lot of Haskell content. You've authored two books, uh, Thinking with Types and Algebra Driven Design, uh, neither of which I think are necessarily like Haskell books, quote unquote, but they do sort of intersect quite a bit. Yeah, I think that's very fair. And uh, you also author the blog, Reasonably Polymorphic. And mm -hmm. uh, you're the author of the PolySemi, am I saying that right? Yeah. PolySemi library for, uh, what's that, like freer effects, effect system? Yeah, some sort of weird effect system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and more recently, you've been working on Wingman for Haskell, which is a tool for, I would say, program synthesis, maybe? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great description of it. <laughs> so so you're, you're telling me it's not like the apex weapon the wingman <laughs> you know is that no. not it no it's not i i really wanted to call it copilot but that one's turned out to already be used mm. really um, yeah what's called copilot there's um there's like a nasa dsl for doing like verified c plus plus programs okay. or something so um, not quite so the same thing not quite the same thing no um but it's a great name and i'm upset that they got it first <laughs> <laughs> well wingman's good too i like that thank you um, so maybe let's launch into that. Could you tell us a little about Wingman? What does it do? Sure. Um, so Wingman is a plugin for the Haskell language server. And the idea is it tries to automate away um, the like hold driven design um, philosophy where you say, like, I don't really know the code I'm writing. I'm going to put it in a hole. And then the compiler tells you what that hole has type, right? It gives you the type of it. And you say, okay, well, I know this thing has some type and I sort of know roughly what type I sh think it should be. So maybe you put an F map in and then you put in another hole mm -hmm. and then it says, okay, well now the hole has changed because you've sort of synthesized some of the program. Um, and for a lot of co code, this turns out to like, you, really what you're doing is just typing in the things GHC tells you to type. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's a little silly, right? So I thought, why not, why don't we just like automate that? Right? Why don't we just automate that conversation with the compiler and see if we can synthesize all sort of the dumb programs that you would write yourself if you just followed the, the holes. Yeah, hmm. uh, we do that surprisingly often here. Uh, we haven't been able to get HLS to work reliably on our code base, unfortunately, oh, no. but we do the like put a type toll in there and then copy paste or just type in whatever GHC suggests. Um, yeah. If there's only one thing, often there are multiple, you know, and then you pick the right one, the one that's probably not meant to. always suggest unsafe coerce. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do that, thankfully. <laughs> the, the trick is to not have that one in scope, I think. Yeah. But um, yeah, we get MIMPTI a lot or like True. const or something like that. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, but yeah, it is kind of silly to be doing this copy pasting and it sounds like wingman automates some of that, but also I got the impression in that, it, that it does more than just naively filling in the hole that GHC suggests. Is that right? Um, yeah. So there, there's sort of two things there. One of which is, uh, we have this, this like proof search going on in the background. And so mm -hmm. it's actually trying to find a good program, um, by, for some definition of good. Right. And that sort of, usually if you write code, um, you'll, you, Often, if you like see code that a beginner has written, they'll like it'll be crazy, and like the type signature doesn't really correspond to the definition, and it's sort of hard to put your hand on what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so like a good metric for that is sort of linearity. You want generally your variables to only be used once, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. that a program where if you can synthesize a solution that only uses your variables once, that's usually better than one that uses them multiple times, right? And or not so, at all. Or not at all, right, exactly, which is the, the const or the unsafe course sort right. of solution. Um, so that is sort of the, the, the interesting part of it. Um, and then we also have a bunch of like ergonomic things going on. And so um, Wingman will also do things like case splitting. And so you can say, 
um, hey, I, I want you to case split on X, and that is some weird AGT, and it'll um, it'll like multiply out every match. So you'll get multiple mm. definitions of the function for every um, possible constructor. Right. That's so that nice. that turns like one typed hole into many potentially, right? And then you yeah, keep exactly. on filling from there. It will. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. And, so, and uh, you mentioned linearity. Uh, yep. I don't want to go too far off on a tangent <laughs> here, but I'm wondering, is there with uh, linear types landed in GHC nine, is there an opportunity for wingman to make use of that information and say, okay, I know that this needs to be used. So therefore that's going to guide my synthesis. Uh, that is a good question. I have not even looked at the linear <laughs> stuff, um, even in the language. So, uh, fair enough. It, so it currently hasn't been it doesn't. very long. Um, but the way it works is it's using all of the information from GHC itself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, presumably GHC will tell me about the multiplicity of my arrows. And then, um, the trick is just to run the proof search such that, such that it, it respects that. So I don't right. think there'd be any challenges there other than just writing the code. Cool. And nice. I mean, wingman could probably write some of that code for you, right? It's true. <laughs> like the more, like the better it gets, the more I use it in daily dog fooding. And, um, it's, it's remarkable how how much like just how lovely it is right mm -hmm. compared to the bad old days where i had to write a case statement for myself and like go look up all the constructors mm -hmm. right it's sort of stupid yeah. how how much work that was and i didn't realize because um just like the ide situation was so bad for haskell that um, like before haskell language server you just it wasn't worth your time often to do it right mm -hmm. so it's it's an amazing uh, change in the last year and so the hls guys are amazing and i wanted to thank them so much yeah well, like I mentioned, we haven't been able to get it working reliably with our code base, but uh, many of us have been working with it in our like side projects or whatever. And mm -hmm. everyone that has it working just immediately falls in love with it. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it really adds a lot to the language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know we've been kind of waiting for this to, to come to the ecosystem because we've been kind of stranded as far as, you know, tools that we have in our tool belt. Mm -hmm. um, and I think actually, yeah. HLS really just, you know, hit a home run more or less for the usability and, and featurefulness that we need in the Haskell community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's It's been like day and night, just how quickly the tooling situation has changed in the last year. Yeah. And it's funny when we were talking to uh, Matt Parsons a couple of weeks ago, he mentioned that since Haskell is such a powerful language, you can kind of get away without having a powerful IDE. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you also have a powerful IDE, <laughs> you just kind of like leapfrog your own productivity. It, it's it's great. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, yeah. Um, so could you tell us uh, how did you come to work on Wingman and program synthesis? What drew you to that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I so maybe two years ago, I I was sort of fed up. I was living in in Ottawa, in Canada, which was an atrocious place, and just sort of missing a lot of the intellectual community I was looking for. And so I decided I was just going to like run away and live on Haskell's couches for as long as I could handle. Yeah, I remember um, that so, post. Yeah, so I made it for <laughs> about four months of like couch surfing and meeting all sorts of really amazing people. Um, and one of the people I met was James King, who had like a little tablet. Um, and he, he was sort of pitching me on this idea of programming on the tablet, right? And mm -hmm. like, what, like, what would you need to do to make that happen? Um, Sort of the, the dream I have is like one day being able to be out in the park on my tablet and like programming like productively out in the park without a keyboard, without a monitor, without any of that crap, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that that question sort of got me thinking about like how how could we find a better interface for programming that isn't just typing on a keyboard? Right. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I, I was talking a lot with uh, Reed Milanix, who has been working on a tactic synthesizer for... Haskell and sort of he does a lot of things in like dependently typed languages where um, they have all the sort of this code synthesis stuff mm -hmm. and he wanted to bring that into Haskell and so he had built like a bunch of really incredible libraries um, that do most of the work and so really my contribution was taking the idea and trying to to bridge the gap there right between right. the interface and the solution okay um, yeah so that's sort of how I got started on it was just um, this like sort of being tired of being on a bus and trying to type yeah, and like having terrible RSI keyboard. for the week after, you know? Yeah. 
Um, it's funny you mentioned different, uh, like using a tablet as sort of a different programming paradigm. Mm -hmm. And I've thought a lot about that as well. I imagine a lot of programmers have of like, why is it that I have to be sitting here with a full size keyboard in order yeah. to be productive? Um, and yeah, it's, it seems like the interface for a tablet would be wildly different or like in VR or on a phone or, or really anywhere, but sitting at a desk with a computer. Right. I think the value of a keyboard is that it lets you type arbitrary strings, right? But right. almost no strings are programs. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's sort of ridiculous that we even use strings to represent these things in the first place. But Right. And a lot of the strings that you end up typing aren't arbitrary. They come from some other part of your code base. That's true. Yeah. Um, even like like keywords are should be auto completable and like mm -hmm. a lot of keywords you need in like together. So I need to, every time I have a case, I need the word of. Exactly. So why do I have to type that? Yeah. Right. At any um, given point, there's only like five things you might want to do. To <laughs> right. So why yeah. don't we just give you those options? I like it. Um, <laughs> and I know a lot of people go down the route of structured editing as a you know, solution to this problem of instead yeah. of typing text into an editor, let's have something like, I think scratch is kind of the prototypical example, but you know, block based where you pull that case statement out of some palette and drop it in your program. Uh, what, how did you, or what uh, kind of led you to program synthesis versus structured editing? I think structured editing is a good approach. Um, I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's a good answer. And I, I guess the other thing is like, even if you are, even if you have a better interface, like still, why do I have to code things that have exactly one solution? Right. Right. A, a huge part, like part of the reason I like Haskell is the, the type system is so good at constraining implementations. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sort of look at like, you've done your job well, if, if there's exactly one solution to your type, right. That means you've designed a good program and then let's just find that thing. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's good because I'm trying to imagine like in JavaScript, what would program synthesis look like? And it seems I don't like it could be done. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. Yeah, um, at least not without crazy AI. Yeah, or, or maybe with TypeScript, there might be enough hints there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, hmm. Actually, we use a plugin called uh, Tab9 that does yeah. a much... Oh, are you familiar with it? Uh, I, I sort of know it exists. It's sort of like machine learning. Yeah. It's Stack very, stuff, I right? don't know how to describe it, maybe like st stochastic, where it just looks at the strings in your code base and figures out how often they occur. Mm -hmm. And then when you start typing something, it's like, oh, normally when this is before the cursor and you're typing this, this is what comes after. So it'll suggest okay. that. Does mm -hmm. it work well? Pretty yeah. well, yeah. Especially for pretty uh, rote stuff like imports or again, HLS solves imports for you. But if you are typing one out, it'll be like, this is a typical module name. Here you go. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be nice to get the more time invested in figuring out how to make HLS work in our program. Mm -hmm. But for the time Do you guys being, use a lot of template Haskell? We have a little bit. We're using more, we've, store, we've turned toward using more of the persistent uh, quasi-quoter for doing our models. So yeah. that's I think adds often up. That, that's the big issue. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can sort of separate that into a different package, I suspect that will solve your problems, but I okay. can promise. We'll poke around with it. We have somewhat, yeah. I mean, like everybody, we have a bespoke environment and we got Docker yeah. containers and we got all kinds of stuff going on. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Cam, you use tab nine, I think more than I do. Uh, so you may be able to speak to like what it does, what it's good at, especially in comparison to HLS. Yeah. I mean, if you're making a sweeping code change across the you know entire code base, it can pretty much figure out what you're trying to type as you, you know, just kind of start it. So it's been really helpful. Um, you know, imports is one that is obviously, it has a lot of examples to analyze and say, hey, this is what we think you're doing, especially because we have pretty consistent naming schemes. So it mm -hmm. makes it really easy. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're writing function definitions, it can get a little tricky sometimes because it wants you to like, if you're doing your type signature, like the next line, it tries to say, oh, you're doing your type signature again. And you're like, wait, no, I'm not I'm trying to like <laughs> actually implement it here. So that yeah. can get a little bit of a, a little bit of annoyance there, but right. overall it's pretty helpful uh, just in the day to day. You know, I think if we can get some HLS love, then you yeah. know, that sh may, the need for that could go away, um, mm -hmm. which would be really cool. It's funny because they're kind of uh, similar solutions to, or, sorry, they're approaching the same problem with radically different solutions. One is like right. very smart, give me as much information from the compiler and I'll use it. And the other is like, 
I don't need to know even what language you're typing. I'll just guess and it'll probably work. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing to me that that works at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is startling. Um, so yeah, try that out and uh, I'd be curious to see what you think about it. Um, but on the topic of program synthesis, I am aware of a couple earlier attempts with Haskell to synthesize programs. Like I think LambdaBot can do some stuff and there's a package called Jin that does something similar. Yeah. Is Wingman built on top of those or related to them in any way? Not at all, no. I don't know how LambdaBot does it, but I know Jin... Um, doesn't work particularly well. I've never used um, it, so I don't know. I just know it exists. Jin will do a lot of like, um, like sort of const stuff. Mm. Mm. It, it, it like doesn't care if it's used arguments. It's just like, here's a solution. Um, one thing that Wingman also does that Jin doesn't is recursion. Mm. And mm. so Jin or uh, Wingman can like implement fold R for you, for example. Wow. Um, and, That's really uh, cool. If it, if it does recursion, it guarantees that. Um, it's recursing on something structurally smaller, so it, it will terminate. It's productive, yeah. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, so Jin, I think, is it's it's interesting that it exists, and sort of it was inspiring to me just to see that someone had made progress there. But um, if you've ever like tried to use it for real, it, it falls short quite soon. Mm. Well, I hadn't tried to use it. I don't think it builds with more recent GHCs, so that's yeah, what fair. prevented me from trying it out. There's um, There's another thing I've heard of called Magic Haskell which is sort of the other way is it says here's some arguments and here's what the output should be and it tries to synthesize a function that produces the outputs from the inputs oh that's cool so more kind of spec based yeah exactly um i hmm. haven't i haven't looked at it the website was down when i tried to run it but that sounds um, really cool I think I, i've heard of similar projects um Sorry. i I, th I think i i'm trying to remember the name there was a project in like scheme or something like that i think it was called barley man or it's been many years since I heard. Anyway, there's there some presentation where it's like you, you give a test case and yeah. it'll produce a function that, you know, meets that. And then you add another test case and it'll churn for a bit and say, okay, well, I have a new function now. And as you add more and more test cases, uh, the implementation gets more and more, you know, don't look behind the curtain type right. implementation, but <laughs> it works technically. <laughs> At least it gives you the outputs for the inputs, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And then um, I, I think for those, that type of program synthesis, uh, property-based tests will give you much more assurance that your implementation is is something more than just a pile of if statements. Like if you give me right. this, I'll give you that, uh, yeah. which I think ties in with algebra div driven design to kind of take a corner here. Um, that was a good segue. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, property-based tests are, you know, a way to state properties that should hold in your system and then test it against your implementation and see if it works. And yeah. algebra driven design is all about coming up with those properties, right? Yeah, it's um, the, the book itself sort of, the main thesis of it is that if we're doing functional program, we should really be thinking about equality of programs, mm -hmm. right? That's sort mm -hmm. of what it buys us over imperative stuff. And, um, and so if you're like designing some API, it's really interesting to ask when are two expressions in this like DSL or this API is the same, right? Right. And we're sort of used to this in everyday Haskell, where you say like fmap.fmap is the same as one fmap, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I, very often, like very rarely do you see people think about this for like the libraries they're writing, right. unless they're the category theory people. <laughs> those kinds of stuff. Um, and so the, the claim is that um, we can think about equality for like very mundane sorts of tasks, right? It, like very mundane, like real world applications that you're writing, um, mm -hmm. they, they should have equalities as well. And um, so, so there's a few things that come from that, right? One of which is if you have these equalities, then of course you can turn them into property tests. And then it right. gives you like wicked amounts of, of just test coverage, right? For every property test, you can generate arbitrary many unit tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, that's exciting. But the other thing is what it does is it constrains your implementation. Right. Um, there's going to be sort of infinite many ways of implementing a program such that like all of these equalities hold. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But often if you like chase the equalities, you can find different ways of representing programs. And so you can you can use the equalities as a tool for as an implementer to say, like, I know that these two things are equivalent, but one of them is maybe faster. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm going to choose that as my sort of basis. Mm -hmm. um, and then use the, the equalities to rewrite all the things the user writes in a language that's um, like useful to them or makes sense to them in a way that is equivalent but faster. Right. And uh, so that sounds to me how to do that. Uh, but that sounds to me like something that is very appealing to programmers, especially I feel like this comes up a lot in like Lisp 
programming where people want a very small like kernel of uh, primitives and then build everything out of that. And it sounds like algebra-driven design is trying to find, uh, maybe in kind of a roundabout way, find those primitives uh, such that they meet all these properties and then you can yeah. shuffle them around behind the scenes to get a good implementation. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a very good way of phrasing it. Um, one thing I'd like to stress is just that the implementation doesn't need to be at all based on the kernels, right? Right. The kernels are for the user, but for the implementation, you can have all sorts of crazy, like, um, specialized primitives that make no sense in user land. But <laughs> that's okay because they're fast. Yeah. And as long as you can prove the equality, it's fine. And, and I think this ties in with something else you said from the book about abstraction, where programmers often think about abstraction as like hiding implementation details. And it does do that, but yeah. uh, it seems to be more powerful when your abstraction is based on this algebra so that you know your abstraction can't leak because the entire, like the rules of the thing are based on the algebra you built. So the implementation kind of by definition does not matter. Yeah, I, I know, think, I'm, yeah, mm. that, that's a, absolutely. I think too many th people think about abstraction is like, oh, I'll put it in a module. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll put it behind <laughs> a date type, right? Or like, I'll, re I'll pull out this implementation to its own function. It's like, mm -hmm. that's not, um, there's a quote from Dijkstra I really like, which is that uh, abstraction is not about being vague, but a, about creating a new semantic level at which you can be absolutely precise. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, like I mentioned earlier, have not made it entirely through this book yet, but I'm really enjoying it so far. And it feels like it'll give me some tools for approaching problems, uh, particularly um, taking the time before diving into implementation to think about the problem and kind of push on the boundaries of it and see where it can be broken down into simpler pieces, which mm -hmm. is something that I've already seen um, in the examples that you give where you talk about like you can come up with a property and it may be very complicated and that suggests that you may have multiple things kind of mixed together there or complected to borrow the you know the rich hickey speak there right um and you would do well to pull those apart and then in doing so you might discover more properties about your program or you might discover a simple simpler way to implement it or you know any number of things so mm -hmm. looking forward to continuing to explore that yeah well uh, I think it's a great book, and I'd strongly recommend it. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you might just be a little bit biased, but I Perhaps. agree with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's not the only book you've written, right? You no, previously wrote another book called Thinking with Types. What is that one about? That one is about all of the um, all the wonky stuff you need to do in order to do type level programming in Haskell, right? Mm. Um, it, it's sort of unfortunate that such a book is necessary. Mm -hmm. Right, because if you look at languages like Agda or um, Cock or like properly dependently typed languages, there is no t type level programming. It's just programming. Right. right. In Haskell, it's it's sort of ridiculous that we have this like constraint kind, where it's sort of a tuple, but it's not really. But it's like a set of constraints, but it's not data dot set. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And it's, it's like, why does this exist? Right. So, um, so thinking with types is sort of a collection of all the folklore that has existed about how to do dependently type stuff or like type level programming more, so, okay. more generally, um, without sort of needing to go through and find all the resources for yourself. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I often, we, we have turned recently into using more, uh, servant, the HTTP API library, which is very much implemented at the type level. And it definitely uh, highlights some of the, I don't know, sharp edges on dealing with this type level of programming in Haskell because you have to leave the very comfortable value level programming world and deal with this entirely different world, which is kind of disorienting. It's the same, but it's different. It's like, right. Mm, and annoyingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's all new terminology to worry about. You know, you got type families and data in it, like just i want to deal with functions and you know the stuff that i know right yeah it's definitely a, a mind bender to some degree mm -hmm. um you know as someone who's not as experienced in haskell like walking into type families and type level programming definitely i mean it's been insightful and fun to learn but it definitely took took a minute so um you know appreciate you taking the time to gather some you know helpful resources for that um that way yeah. people aren't bouncing around all over the internet trying to figure <laughs> out what do i do what are type families how does this work yeah 
as an experienced Haskeller, it doesn't make my brain bend any less. <laughs> it's it's just weird and like every single time I need to repage all these arcane rules for how to do it. And mm. um, as I get older and wiser, I sort of the more I feel like maybe this is a bad approach, and like maybe we just shouldn't be doing these things except in like very very small. Yeah. So do you feel like we should be pushing toward dependently typed languages or we should be pushing toward more like give up on the type level programming and focus on the value level stuff? Um, I think either of those would be okay. <laughs> but we're kind of in the <laughs> middle right now and that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I don't know what the dependent Haskell story is going to look like, but I'm hoping it will just work in mm -hmm. the way that like lean or Idris just works. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I hope it is. I I want to believe, but based on what the current type story is, I don't know if I, I feel it yet. I haven't internalized yeah. it. Yeah, I haven't uh, been following the dependent Haskell thread. I, I, I haven't played with really any dependent uh, dependently typed languages. I'm aware of Idris, and every time I see uh, a tweet pop up with it, I'm like, man, that looks pretty cool. I should <laughs> check it out sometime. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not hopeful that Haskell as a language and community will be able to shift from not being dependently typed to being dependently typed. It seems like too much of a change, but you know, maybe it'll happen. And I think with uh, linear types, that's a, that's a similar type of change. Mm -hmm. And maybe if that one goes really well, that could bode well for also doing dependent types. Yeah. Is your concern sort of that there's like too much baggage or too much like ego or, um, or just like maybe the implementation won't be what we want or? I, I would be afraid of baggage. Like we have so many things, as bad as the type level programming situation is now, right. um, people are at least familiar with it. You know, right. it's close at hand uh, to continue borrowing Rich Hickey-isms. Um, and if we say, okay, well, all that is gone now and it's replaced with this thing that is better, but you have to relearn everything. Maybe that'll mm -hmm. be too much and people will give up or, or maybe it'll be great and everyone will jump ship to it i don't know the 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 like dream of dependent types is that they it works just like values and so there is nothing to learn right right mm. that's the but promise if, if you're already well. familiar with like the singletons library or like servant would have to be i would assume completely rewritten yeah and you but know maybe the a good thing i think servant's an amazing piece of engineering but i wish it didn't exist yeah i, I think i agree <laughs> with you i really enjoy using it and everything that it gets us but uh, it's yeah, beautiful it's... when it works well, and when it doesn't, you get these like type tornadoes that go yeah, for, like, like five pages, and they just scroll <laughs> all the way across several times. <laughs> yeah, people like to give JavaScript a hard time for like the nested callback thing, but yeah, yeah those servant type errors are are much worse. It's Oof. it's amazing when it works. It's so fantastic, um, mm -hmm. and if you can follow the happy path, it's great. Unfortunately, I find I'm not good at following the happy path often. Yeah, we try to stay on it. Uh, I heard someone. I wish I could remember who, but I heard them say that like the. The best thing to do as a programmer is just don't do weird stuff. And the hard part <laughs> is figuring out what the weird stuff is. So yeah, with servant, as long as you stay on the straight and narrow, then it works great. But otherwise, yeah, I'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't think we're going to get to the answer today of is dependently typed Haskell going to work or not. But I, I'm just, um, I feel like if there's enough work involved with the switchover, then it's going to be a hard sell versus oh, well, I'll switch to Idris or I'll switch to, you know, whatever other language. Yeah. Haskell has the advantage in that we have users. <laughs> <That's the thing. laughs> Take like, that, Idris. All these other languages are really cool, but nobody nobody really outside of the core group of researchers and, like, some academics, as far as I can tell, really use these things. Right. Um, and so I think it would be hard to... I, th I think Haskell has momentum. I think it's probably past the... the I think it will exist forever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in one way or in, another. In one way or another, right? Um, so I, I, I think that's promising. And um, I'm really curious to see how they deprecate the old stuff for mm -hmm. when dependent type Pascal happens, right? Yeah. Um, do you still support all the weird type family stuff? I guess you have to, but I think it's they got would. weird semantics, right? And yeah. I mean, given how GHC in particular supports stuff now, um, it seems like they would support it for quite a while, you know? Yeah, that's a very good point. That that actually scares me more than anything else. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> yeah, GHC seems to be very, um, and, and probably for the best, but they seem to be very hesitant to deprecate anything and get rid of yeah. anything. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing if you're a user of GHC. Mm -hmm. It's less so if you are like a, a revolutionary 
and want yeah. to change the language. <laughs> so I Maybe, understand yeah. why they do it, but I wish they wouldn't, but I don't, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, and if it weren't there, I would miss it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But... Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for explaining thinking with types to us. It sounds like both Cam and I could do well to read it and maybe uh, understand what we're doing with Servant a little better. Um, yeah, I think sure. it would probably help if uh, if you're just sort of bashing your head against the wall. Saying, yeah. Why doesn't Why doesn't this work? Where's the Sounds tornado like come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd like to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about your PolySimi library, um, cool. which maybe is a little old hat by now. But um, yeah, tell us about it. What is it? Why people may want to use it? Yeah. Um, so PolySimi is free monads um, done better, I guess is how I would phrase it. Okay. Um, and so the idea is sort of you can abstract away from a, a specific monad stack, uh, like a monad transformer thing. Mm -hmm. And instead you can say, uh, I have these effects in scope, and these effects can be like really fine tuned. You can say like, I have a connection to an FTP client or okay. an FTP server, or I have like, um, I have the ability to read and write to some data source that is a key value source statefully, but I don't care what that is. Maybe that's a, uh, yeah. So. Um, so the idea is sort of you can separate your business logic, which is I have some abstractions I care about from the actual implementations of those things. Mm -hmm. um, that's the cell at the high level, okay. and uh, I guess of all of all effect systems, and uh, and then later you can choose how to interpret those systems. And so I can say, oh, I have this this key value store, and like maybe that's Redis, or maybe that is HTTP requests, or <laughs> maybe it's a local file, right? Or maybe it's just a local state monad. Um, it, the, the application shouldn't care. Right. You right. only care about the interface that it exposes. Yeah, exactly. Like, and so, so the pitch is sort of like, what did the business people care about? Can we express that in 10 lines of code? Mm -hmm. Right. And generally, if you're at a high enough, high enough level of abstraction, the answer is yes. Um, and, and that's really lovely, right? When you get to a point where all of your business logic is comprehensible and then you sort of transform it through these um, transformations of I have this one effect and I can implement it either directly or I can say I can implement it in terms of other effects and so I can say I can implement this state but only if I've got access to a, a web client mm, okay right um, but then that web client you might also want to mock and so it's not actually talking to the web right right uh, so so that's sort of the the idea um, Polysemy what it brings to the table is makes it much easier to do these sorts of things um, Easier so, than what? Easier than uh, uh, there's a, another library called like Freer Simple and Freer Effects and mm -hmm. Freer and uh, there's like 20 different free monad libraries in various states of uh, love, really. <laughs> 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 um, and the idea for this was I wanted it to be um, easy and fast and give good error messages if you screwed something up. And so that, th those were the goals. And um, the last one in particular was quite challenging. Uh, and it requires like, it requires a plugin to run, which in retrospect was a bad idea. Because mm -hmm. um, it means you just have to keep that up to date with GHC versions in a way that like a library doesn't need to be. Right. Wait, um, so it, it requires a plugin in order to work at all or in order to get it those doesn't, No, not in order to work at all, but in order to, um, to like get type inference working. Mm. Okay. There's a lot of programs you'll write in Polysemy that without the plugin, you'll say, obviously this is what I want. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> I don't know what this effect is. And you're like, there's only one effect there. It's, right. it's clearly that one, but <laughs> uh, it doesn't know. And so there's a, there's a plugin that like solves those. So it's sort of a, a type checker addition. Cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I can appreciate that keeping up with the GHC API is a little tedious. Um, we were just talking about how good they are at maintaining backwards compatibility. That's for their, you know, the compiler the and everything, yeah. not for the <laughs> internals, which shift around much more often. Right. Um, on the, on the, the other hand, like I appreciate it. I wish there were a better compatibility story though. There's mm -hmm. like the GHC lib now, uh, which I think solves this problem. I've never really worked against it. I think it's newer than my issues, but yeah, and there is the GHC library for like parsing, right? That uh, yeah. Shane Fletcher, I think, maintains. Um, and yeah, that seems really nice to say, like, okay, I, I don't really use all the particulars, or I can do a, a mm -hmm. pretty straightforward mapping between all the versions, and he has done that for you. 
That one unfortunately doesn't work if you also need GHC, the library. Right. Um, because it, uh, the parser has just redefined all the types it needs, hmm. which is lovely, except when you now want to talk back to GHC, it's like, oh, my expression <laughs> is not the same as your expression, even though it's identical. Oh. Right? That's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think it's it's much better state of affairs than the old like source extensions situation mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Um, but I haven't had the joy of working with it yet. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that it's nice to have the option of writing these plugins, you know, and I think that uh, there are a couple kind of big name ones. I guess I can only really think of one. The record dot preprocessor has kind of like yeah. a preview of language extensions to come. Um, yeah. But interesting to see them used here for an effect library as well. Yeah, um, I, I think these days I don't really endorse free monads. Okay, um, what changed? Alexis uh, Lexis King wrote an article maybe this year, maybe last year. It's hard to keep track. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> time is a flat circle. Yeah, it's weird. Yes. Um, talking about how all of my claims for performance were untrue. And um, she was absolutely right about that. And unintentionally, okay. unintentionally untrue, right? Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't going out of my way to lie about it. But um, some issues sort of in the benchmarking and how the simplifier works and just like there were several systematic errors that led to my performance claims being untrue. Um, okay. So that was part of it. And then um, the good news, I guess, or bad news, depending on how you look at it, is that sort of all effect systems have terrible performance, including MTL. And mm -hmm. nobody noticed because everybody's bad at benchmarking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a hard it's thing to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's not to say like MTL is as bad as Plissimi, but um, so on one hand, like I claim the performance doesn't really matter for most of the things we write. Right. Yeah. Most of the time you're waiting on a network call or, or, you know, IO or something. So usually it doesn't matter, but it's, it would still be nice to get that right. Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, um, the thing is I realized, I think we're all better off just sort of mock, like writing pure programs. If you just push all the effects as far out as possible, mm -hmm. that's just a better solution in general. Yeah. Um, are you familiar Matt Parsons with actually has a lot of like good articles on how to do this. Right. And the, the three layer Haskell cake, I think is one of them. Um, that one I'm not as fond of. Okay. <laughs> I think he's got one called invert your mocks. There you go. And that one is sort of all about how to like pull out the pure parts of effective programs. And I really endorse that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, uh, there's some, I, I'm drawn to that, uh, approach of designing software because it extends outside of Haskell as well. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're familiar with Gary Bernhardt, he has a talk about, um, uh, what is it? Imperative shell pure core. It may not be the exact wording, but like, yeah, push everything to the outside. And then on the inside, you've already done all the network, all the database, all that. And you just deal yeah. with the pure stuff. Unfortunately, humans seem bad at writing code like that, especially when like time pressure arises and it's like, oh, I just need IO here. Mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. be fucked to do it the right way. Right. <laughs> um, and then over time that stuff accumulates and sort of, I think that was really what I was rallying against with Plissimi was um, I had worked in like a pretty atrocious code base professionally, mm -hmm. which just the entire thing was in IO and there was no sort of um, discipline anywhere about what things were pure. And so just w like we, we found a multi-million dollar bug that bit us because we just couldn't test anything because it was all in IO. Yikes. That's pretty bad. So I can so, see why that would motivate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the problem is sort of motivation like these are it's only ever after the fact, right? Yeah. Nobody really cares if you say, hey, everything is an IO and it's going to cause us millions of dollars, but it, it doesn't work until it happens, right? So. Right. And then when it happens, you get the uh, the peanut gallery on Reddit saying like, ah, you could have you could have caught this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I think it was um, it was a really interesting project for me to just go through and learn how to do all of the stuff and really flex my type level muscles. Yeah, I was um, going to say, lots of type level programming in there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm happy that it's taken off um, in a way that I didn't expect. Um, I, I think that's exciting to me and also a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> scary <laughs> how? Just like, I, people are using your software I, out there? Not, not because how I would like to write programs anymore. Gotcha. I think I've I've learned something now that I hadn't learned back then. And so people using that sort of reflects like either I'm wrong now or they're wrong <laughs> now, right? Yeah, and neither <laughs> of which is, is a good place to be. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm not sure what the answer is. But um, anyway, so I'm happy people use it. I'm happy I get the credit for it. 
uh and <laughs> you, you know there's worse things in the world than people using your software yeah mm -hmm. uh, i'm i'm curious we were talking earlier about uh dependently typed programs and how yeah. you know haskell is kind of halfway there and it's awkward um i have a passing familiarity with pure script which has sort of an effect system baked in thanks to the row mm -hmm. types uh, I'm, do you have any experience with that and how does it kind of stack up against the free monads? I don't have really any experience with that. Okay. I know it existed and then they sort of chopped it out of IO. Yeah. They kept the bro types and I don't, I don't know anything more than that. Yeah. I think, um, again, I only have a passing familiarity, so apologies to anyone in the PureScript community if I get this way wrong. But, uh, from what I recall, they had, um, or they have row types, uh, so they can do like anonymous records and those also exist at the type level. So you can have an anonymous, uh, map of named things to, uh, I think they just called them effects. So you'd have like some kind that represented, I can talk to the database mm -hmm. and, and, uh, your functions say, okay, I need this effect in order to work. And I think they don't do that anymore. You can if you want to, but like officially they effectively just have IO as their effect. Um, so it was uh, interesting for me to see like, okay, they have all this power, they can express all this stuff at the type level and they kind of don't want to. Um, and they'll right. go back to doing things the way that Haskell does it. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't, maybe maybe they've tried it and given it a go and realized, oh, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just like Haskell has the prestige and you, there's this weird monad thing where once you realize, <laughs> once you learn about monads, you need to write about them. Yeah. And like, I, I think that is a big problem. I don't know if that's relevant here, but I think I could see that happening where like someone says, oh, monad transformers, let's use those because Haskell uses those. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't know anything about pure script, so I don't know if that's the sentiment they have, but. Um, so uh, to try to shove these pieces together, I think one of the problems that pure script ran into was that um, if your effect kind, like the thing that says, hey, I need to be able to talk to or write to the console or read from it or whatever. Mm -hmm. If that isn't shared among every uh, library that you're working with, then you get this very strange fracturing where you have, let's say, two different Redis libraries uh -huh. and they each define their own effect. And so if you have one and you want to use the other, suddenly you have to like redo all of the effects all the way up your chain because you have both of them now. Um, and I, I feel like Haskell also can have this problem where oh, like absolutely we do. you know yeah. if some fundamental type isn't defined low enough then everybody defines their own and it becomes a zoo um and maybe that's just way more annoying to deal with when you're at the effect level i i think that's true um i'm hoping that people don't i i guess that's one of the things i liked about post me was sort of the high level idea of like i just have some key value state mm -hmm. right um mm -hmm. the thing about if you have like an, a redis effect is that the only implementation of that can be redis Right. There's, you can't do anything other than like Redis or re-implementing Redis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could try. Yeah. You could try, but at that point, why? Right. Right. Um, and so I think there's a value in like keeping your effects as small as possible exact, exactly for this reason, regardless of the system or like if it's just MTL or even if it's just like making a monad stack, yeah. a concrete monad stack of just like keeping your effects as small as possible because otherwise you're making choices that you're going to have to live with mm -hmm. right um and unfortunately like you have to make choices at some point but again if you can push them as far out as possible yeah uh, uh, it makes life, life so much easier i agree with you but i'm not surprised to hear you say that based on <laughs> algebra driven design because it, it's like you know if your interface is i am redis then it's really hard to come up with properties about that to mock it to do anything but if your interface right. the, is yeah. i'm a key value store much easier Exactly. Yeah. Like what are the properties of Redis? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, know if there are any, right? Like, are you guaranteed <laughs> to get back what you put in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, well, we've, uh, covered a lot of good topics here. Uh, Sandy, is there anything else, uh, you know, what are you working on? What are you looking forward to? Uh, what's next for you? Yeah. Um, so right now I'm working like full time on uh, Haskell wingman, wingman for Haskell. Mm -hmm. The branding is still <laughs> being figured still out. Still up in the air. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and so I'm trying to make that like my full-time life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've got a Patreon for that if uh, if anyone's interested in helping support me through that. For sure. Um, yeah, we'll so leave a, sort of, a link to that in the show notes. Oh, marvelous. Thank you. Um, that's like where all my time is going. I'm putting like 10 hours a day into it right now. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, besides that, um, I think that's it really. Like 
That's all I'm doing. <laughs> it, it feels good, honestly. It's nice awesome. to have like a project you really care about. Yeah. And uh, if people want to find you online, where should they go look for you? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm online at reasonablypolymorphic.com is my math blog. And I also have sandymaguire.me, which is my personal blog. And it mm -hmm. turns out like, I'm, I'm going to shill them both, but there's really no market for like, there's no intersection of people who care about both of those things. <laughs> right? People care about my math stuff or they care about uh, like me as a person. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I learned that the hard way. I need to split them up, but I'll, I'll shill them both. And uh, I think that's, that's pretty much all of my online presence. All right. Nice. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. It's been great to have you here. And oh, uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And I just want to thank you both for like all the great things you've been doing for the community. Thanks. We appreciate it. Gonna keep on keeping on. Yeah. I like that. Cheers. <laughs> Please do. Uh, and uh, thank you to the listeners of the Haskell Weekly podcast. Um, thanks for tuning in, even though we're not here every week. We're here most weeks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've been your host, Taylor Fossack, and our special guest this week was Sandy McGuire. Also with me today was Cameron Guerra. If you want to find out more about Haskell Weekly, you can visit our website, which is haskellweekly.news. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Uh, and if you have any feedback, you can tweet it at us. Our handle is at Haskell Weekly. Um, and yeah, we're elsewhere on the web, but those are the main ones. Yep. And Haskell Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company, and our employer. They would like to offer you 30% off your subscription by using promo code HaskellWeekly30 at checkout. Um, so if you're ever interested in IT cybersecurity training, you know, we have anything and everything you need. So uh, mm -hmm. check it out if you're interested. But I think that about does it for us, Taylor and Sandy. Yeah. Sure does. So thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week. Peace.